So I have the great honor of being the director of the Rutgers Addiction Research Center, which is actually the largest comprehensive addiction research center in the world. We have over 100 researchers who span everything from neuroscience and genomics all the way through to treatment and recovery. They represent more than 40 departments and 26 specialty centers across all the Rutgers campuses. And we are all working together collaboratively to tackle this huge problem that is addiction. We hear a lot about the opioid epidemic, and there's good reason for that. Opioids kill about 100,000 individuals a year, and the reason we hear so much about the opioid epidemic is because opioids can kill quickly, and that's frightening. But what we don't talk nearly as much, nearly enough about, is the 11 million lives that are lost every year around the world to substance use problems. Substance use problems are the leading cause of death and disability that is preventable. It's a grand challenge because substance use has been around since the earliest part of civilization. Substance use problems are essentially killing the equivalent of 60 Boeing 747s every day. Imagine if a jumbo jet went down every 20 minutes. You wake up in the morning, 20 jumbo jets went down. That's the number of lives that are being lost every day to nicotine, alcohol, opiates, and other substances. It's a huge problem, and it's one that we are actually able to tackle if we work together. It's a grand challenge. Most people choose to use alcohol and other drugs recreationally. So about 85% of us in the United States choose to smoke, to drink, to use other drugs recreationally, one in four individuals will develop problems. One in 10 will develop a severe addiction. So what are we doing about this? We've learned a tremendous amount about what causes substance use disorders. We know part of the reason is in our genes and part in our environment. So about half of the differences between all of us in how likely we are to drink or to develop problems or to smoke or develop an addiction to nicotine is due to the sequence of the DNA that we were born with. And the other half is due to differences in our environments. So things found in our families, in our schools, in our neighborhoods, in our peer groups. One of the things that we do know is that despite what you might see in the media still, there is no gene for alcoholism or gene for opioid use disorder. Instead, we know that there are hundreds of genetic variants that each just increase or decrease risk a little bit. But we are making tremendous progress in identifying those specific genes. So the way that we conceptualize this is that we all have a mental health jar. So imagine it, a clear kind of mason jar our mental health jar, when it's full, that's when we're actively experiencing problems. And what are the things that can go in that jar? Well, it's all of those thousands of genetic variants and all those environmental risk factors. So all of us have some vulnerability to develop substance use problems. Some of us are lucky and we're born with just some risk increasing variants. Some people are unlucky, and they're born with jars that are already three quarters of the way full. They're born with a lot of genetic risk. And lots of us fall somewhere in the middle. But what you can also tell from this is that no one is born with a substance use disorder or destined to develop a substance use disorder. Instead, you might start life with lower risk, over time, you're gonna accumulate some environmental factors. And if you're at low risk, you can still accumulate a lot of environmental risk factors or maybe a big trauma that can lead the, to the development of problems. On the other hand, you might start with higher genetic risk, 
Over time, it doesn't take as much environmental risk to lead to problems. So this is how we help conceptualize this idea that substance use disorders are influenced by our genes and our environments, that we all have different levels of risk, and of course we all have our own unique jar. We have our own unique set of genetic and environmental risk factors that we carry. So scientists like myself and here at Rutgers are leading some of the largest gene identification projects for substance use disorders in the world. So in our latest consortium, we're including data from nearly 4 million individuals. And we have identified over 1,400 locations across the genome that elevate risk. And what we can do is we can sum them up, weight them by their effect size, and create for any one of us now a genetic risk score, an indication of how many of those marbles are in your jar. And we have learned a tremendous amount from these genetic variants about the ways in which our genes influence risk for substance use disorders. Some of this risk is the way that bodies respond to drugs, so physiological processes. So this might be genes that influence the metabolism of alcohol or opiates. That's why some individuals, when they take an opiate, might get a tremendous buzz, and other individuals feel nauseous and think, how does anyone ever become addicted to this? When I talk to people, it turns out that this is what I find most people are thinking of when I talk about genetic influences on the liability of developing a problem with substances. But it actually turns out that this is the smallest way, just a tiny piece of that heritability of how our genes influence risk. It turns out that the much bigger way that our genes influence risk for the likelihood of developing addiction isn't about how bodies respond to drugs, it's about how brains are wired. And so what we know is that the much bigger risk pathways are what we sometimes call externalizing, meaning the way we interact with the external world. And this is how brains process risk, reward, and consequences. So some of us have brains that are very primed on the exciting things that are right in front of us. This is you hear in the media about the dopamine seekers, right? These are people who are highly attuned to rewards, who like taking risks, who get a big buzz from that. Their brains don't immediately and naturally think through, who, what are all the potential consequences of this? The other pathway is related to how brains process anxiety and fear. And so we know that some people have brains that are more likely to worry. And these individuals can be more prone to anxiety, to depression, and that when there are not effective coping strategies in place, that this can lead to an elevated rate of developing substance use problems when substances are used to cope. Now, what this means, because we are born with our genes, is that the child that is the highly impulsive little kiddo, the one who is dangling from the tops of trees, who's jumping off the top of the playground equipment, who's giving parents a heart attack, who's ending up in the ER a lot, we know that this child, if you fast forward a decade, is much more likely to be this person. <laughs> But not necessarily. There's no reason that same genetic disposition can't be channeled into this or into this. And in fact, for full disclosure, this little risk taker is in fact my little risk taker who comes by it honestly. His father, my father, my brother are in fact all fighter pilots. So this really gets at the fact that these genetic dispositions are not inherently bad or good. There are good and there are not so good parts of all of our dispositions. Turns out that understanding this and that this is how our genes are influencing risk for addiction is really important for prevention. Because no one wakes up one morning to discover they've had an onset of alcohol problems overnight. Nobody wakes up and goes, oh my gosh, I have opioid use disorder. There's a trajectory of risk-related behavior. 
It shows up, these genetic predispositions show up early in development, and we can use this information to intervene early. I speak to thousands of parents every year, and the number one thing they say to me is, I wish I could know. I wish I could know if my child is one of the ones who will not be able to use alcohol or other drugs recreationally without it taking over their lives and developing problems. And I would think, you can. Tell me about your child and I can tell you how at risk they are. We have learned so much. And so that's really what we're working on now, is how do we take all of this information and apply it to this radical concept that we could actually stop addiction before it starts. So we know a ton about how our genes and our environments contribute to risk. And when we put these things together, when we combine those genetic risk scores I talked about with behavioral and environmental information, we can powerfully differentiate individuals who are at low risk from individuals who are at high risk. And so, for example, individuals with the lowest genomic risk scores and who have low behavioral and environmental risk, only about 4% of them go on to develop a substance use disorder. Conversely, individuals with the highest levels of genomic risk, behavioral and environmental risk, almost 84% of them develop a problem. And so what we have been working on is putting this information together in a way that we can bring it to the public. And we've developed what we call CARES, or the Comprehensive Addiction Risk Evaluation System. The whole idea is you can go to an online platform, you create an account, you fill out a short survey, and that survey consists of the items that in our studies of tens of thousands of kids followed from childhood through to adulthood, it indexes the behaviors and the environmental factors that are most predictive of who develops problems. We send you a saliva kit, you spit in a tube, send it off to the lab, we scan the genome, we create genomic risk scores. We put all this information together to create personalized addiction risk profiles. But we, of course, don't just want to tell someone they're at risk. We then want to connect them with personalized resources to reduce the likelihood that they will ever develop problems. Because, as we are fond of saying, DNA is not destiny. That impulsive little risk-taking kiddo, he might be more at risk for substance use problems, but he also has an increased likelihood of being a fighter pilot, a CEO, an entrepreneur, Knowledge is power. How do we essentially use the information we're learning about genetic predispositions so that we can convert them into our secret superpowers and reduce the challenges that might come along with some of those dispositions? And this is why we've also partnered with a startup company, Thrive Genomics, which I co-founded, with the idea that we need to do more to bring these research advances to the public to help address this massive public health problem. And this really embodies the spirit of Helix, where we are embracing innovation and impact. Because by working together, we don't just have to accept that addiction is a part of our lives and that many of us will know individuals who are affected and that millions of individuals are going to lose their lives to addiction-related causes, by working together, we can actually end the addiction epidemic. With that, I thank you for your time, and I will be around today, and I'm happy to answer any questions.